I is the last intersection. There's only problem is the cops are behind us. And that's the and there needs to be there needs to be some set of decision making about the strategy. The other groups that we're working with, i.e. the YCL and the and the, the raging grandmas, have already deployed. So everybody's there without our support. So I'm marching this way, and I strongly encourage other people to continue to support people. Like, could everyone agree to all go? Because if we're just going to split it yeah. right now, yeah. What do you guys see about the Barricade across the street right here? Which side? Which side? That side. What do you think? This demonstration, it's so much about so many different issues, and so many people have been able to rally around it that, I mean, I think that's in a lot of ways why it's incredible, and that's why hopefully it'll be effective. For this day, at this time, this intersection is ours. I'm here to demonstrate against the IMF and the World Bank for the injustices they've done to people all over the world and for the injustices they've done here in the U.S. I am protesting against the IMF. It is not right. It is unchristian. We're not about property and social. We're not about hurting people with violence and stuff. We're just about a non-violent resistance to the, to the corporate aggression that they're trying to push on us. In a large meeting yesterday at um, the Convergence Spot, we coordinated with, you know, representatives from thousands of other groups as to what strategically would be our position. And we came and we took control of this and... We just talked to the police. They communicated this is a non-violent protest. They said they're not going to do anything to it that you have to do. And they understand that this is a non-violent protest. Good. World Bank and the International Monetary Fund was set up shortly after the Second World War. And the idea was to initially solve the problems of reconstructing Europe after the war, and eventually the idea was broadened to have them uh, provide uh, help for countries in the third world to develop and become industrialized and to get rid of poverty. World Bank is a development agency. It was supposed to be that. The World Bank was supposed to provide loans to developing countries, countries who were just getting their independence from their colonizers. They were supposed to provide those loans to assist those countries in the development projects. International Monetary Fund was set up not as a development agency. Its job was to, is to establish monetary financial stability. Once the economies were rebuilt in Europe and in Japan, um, then it, it looked to this poverty alleviation mission. Well, bullshit. Let's just call it what it is. It's, it's a false policy. Uh, it's not really what their mission is about. Their mission is about economic development uh, for the betterment of those who are bettered by economic development. Back in 82, I was asked to do uh, consultancy as a member of the team. When I went over and saw at that time in 82 how they could take hundreds of millions of dollars and basically throw it down a rat hole in terms of helping poor people, uh, the only beneficiaries that I saw of that project were American and multinational firms. It is a for-profit bank and it's been very successful in making profits. It makes a billion dollars plus a year in profits. We have to look at what some of us are calling the unholy trinity of World Bank, IMF, as well as the World Trade Organization. WTO, you know, opens the barriers for trade. The World Bank provides the finance uh, for these development projects. And then as a result of the fact that everybody's competing against each other, the prices drop and the IMF steps in to provide short-term finance. And the only way they do that is by cutting um, the money that uh, people spend, governments spend, on health services, education, and nutrition, and that kind of thing. And the IMF and World Bank is busy recommending the privatization of water, the privatization of electricity, and uh, running uh, uh, local government basic services along profit line, along commercial line. And this has led to job losses and an increase in the price of these basic services. 
Ukraine mass and the World Bank are undemocratic. They are not allowing also um, the people from Central America or Latin America or third world countries to democratically make decisions. And they pretty much impose these structural adjustment programs that pretty much abolish social benefits. Always the IMF World Bank, when it gives out a loan, there's always, on the other hand, what you call structural adjustment programs. And part of that is um, you have to cut down on health services, on social services in general. So concretely, like for health services, we only have 2% of the national budget for that, vis-a-vis -vis, um, paying the debt, which is like 30 to 50% of the budget. So there goes the budget. Concretely, that means that for every Filipino, there's only a one cent per day. <laughs> budget. So, wow, what can you buy with one cent? The World Bank makes more money than it pays out. Therefore, for all the money it puts out, it gets more money back into its coffers. There's also a net outflow of resources such as timber, gold, oil, copper, but also uh, agricultural products which come at the expense of depleting the soils uh, and the um, environment of local countries. Because of the World Bank policies, because of this IMF structural adjustment programs, as the currencies are devalued, there is no market for American products. It is going to hit America. Secondly, because the wages are being driven down in other countries, the jobs are moving overseas. Because of their policies, the policies which have not helped my people, policies which have destroyed forests, policies which uh, encourages the construction of dams, the canalization of rivers, policies which encourage the impoverishment of our people, which has led to the wiping out of the middle class, policies which are is creating social injustice on a mass scale. It is those policies that have encouraged anti-democracy to emerge. It is those policies that we have come to protest peacefully, non-violently, so that the world can, have a, can be a better place for us all. Here we have the lowest incomes, here we have the highest infant mortality rate in the United States, right here in Washington, D.C. And that is in part, indirectly at least, a consequence of the efforts of the IMF, the efforts of the World Bank. They do no good, they're useless, they're harmful. My name is David. I live on the street in D.C. What's it like to live in D.C., one of the, the, the cradle of democracy in the United States? It sucks. It sucks because there is no, there is no, uh, no resource. They tell us that there are resources, but there are no real resources. It's hard to get a job in Washington? Sure it is. Can't get nothing in Washington. There's nothing there for homeless people. There's nothing there for poor people here in D.C. It's all a fallacy. It's all a fake You know, all these beautiful buildings are not for poor people. It's for the rich, and the rich keep getting rich, and the poor keep getting poor. Do they give you a place to sleep? Yeah, I'm on the street. You know, and that's where we are. That's what it's like in D.C. Sleeping on the street, waking up hungry. No place to bathe. Yeah, you know, that's it. African Americans specifically need to really recognize how this is affecting us. I know people in this community may be feeling intruded upon and feel like, why are they impeding upon our community? Why are they coming into the place where we live and disrupting things and causing these huge police force? This is just a preface to what's really going to go down if we allow the IMF to persist and to continue doing what they're doing. What's the contract on America about? What is welfare reform about? You know, that's our own form of structural adjustment that we need to be fighting against here in this country. We're talking about all the stuff that they're doing in other countries, but this country is messing up first. If we don't fix this country, then we don't get nothing to You know, we can come down here and march all day long, but if we don't talk about the atrocities of this country and what this country is doing, because this country is a trendsetter, then we got problems. 
You know, we have to look bigger. We have to look more than just to the drug dealer on the community. We need to look higher than just the police officers on our streets. What is motivating them? There's an agenda here, you know? And we as people of color, we need to recognize, we need to stop, we need to look past our own nose and recognize that we are not an island in these cities and these communities in the United States. These type of things are affecting people all across the world. We're having like SAP enacted upon our communities in the United States, our minority communities. It's unbelievable what they're doing to our people and we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that and combat it. Well, we don't trust you guys because well, you have you been harassing us for days and days. Morning, the mobilization for global justice warehouse location where we've been building giant and beautiful puppet images of both our future that we'd like to have and the repression of the World Bank and the IMF. Our mobilization space has been raided. Uh, we had actually been getting, from what I understand from our inspectors, uh, citizens' complaints about the activity in the building all week long. We, the immediate neighborhood that they're in, is not complaining, have no problems. So where is all the confusion coming from? We're not getting it. Mm -hmm. They're not getting any answers either. Why did they wait until we have several thousand people arriving in town the day before the event when we've been going for a week? Let's go. Let's go. Everybody out there, let's go, sir. Is the police just enters without a search warrant, locks up a place with all the possessions, a handful of possessions the young people have traveled with across this country, none of them have loads of money to go and feed themselves. The food is the community kitchen and they are being denied the access to feeding themselves. This is one of the controversial uh, peppers that was brought out from the kitchen area. Uh, the police, police raided the convergence space earlier today claiming that we possessed uh, chemicals that could possibly make uh, um, pepper spray with. And to be quite truthfully honest, um, this looks like a harmfulest pepper to me. Many of them have their clothes left inside. They're standing here in the rain and the cold and the wet. And medicine, there was a woman crying in the other community hall because she needs the medicine that's locked up here. And they release a few puppets to make a little play of this. Somebody very scared of our big puppets, and uh, they should be because our big puppets spread the message of coming together, of peace, of joy, of solidarity, of how you can come together in a protest and have it be a beautiful thing. And they should be scared of our puppets. We're um, in front of the IMF, um, a good distance from it, blocks from it, um, and AIDS activists are here today locking down to a giant image of uh, the glutton IMF. And in Latin America and in Sub-Saharan Africa, two regions of the globe where uh, the IMF structural adjustment programs and crippling debt burden are actually killing people with HIV. We are calling on the Clinton administration, on the U.S. government, to use its voice as the largest stakeholder to the IMF to call for unconditional debt burden to save the lives of people in poverty living with HIV who are being killed by the policies of the IMF. As an addict, a recovering addict and alcoholic myself, I'm also HIV positive. When I came to Philadelphia, I was 144 pounds and I had lost the will to live. So I went through like a spiritual experience that allowed me to be okay. When I came to that experience, then there was act up. So I've only been doing one thing since 1997. I've been learning the tactics of activism, of civil disobedience, of getting involved and taking that back to the community that I come from. <laughs> We'll go around and we, we, we go to all the recovery houses. We do teach and presentations to let them know what is going on with the IMF. I'm just here for my brothers and sisters in Africa and all over the world. And we have a lot of 
fun today. <laughs> well, first of all, right, we don't want the fun to overshadow the importance of this event. Millions of people around the world are dying for pennies because of pennies. And I don't think that should happen. I, I, I myself suffer from AIDS. I'm fortunate to have contracted AIDS here in America where I have access to the medication. But what about the people that don't? I would like for everyone to look around you and imagine that one in every five of you are HIV positive. Now imagine that you have no access to treatment. Then you will die. It is very worrisome because what happened on Saturday was, was an example of how a police state, you know, uh, functions and reacts. And we're talking about organized police terror. You all you merchants of lies. You advertise peace while you bomb the sky. Your words, they mean nothing. Well, the International Action Center called a rally and march in front of the Department of Justice several weeks back uh, to protest uh, the prison industrial complex to show our solidarity with all of the other actions that were taking place in uh, D.C. targeting the role of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. We didn't apply for a march permit because you don't have to apply for a march permit if you're going to be walking on the sidewalk. Uh, we asked them to please get up on the sidewalk, and they refused, tried to take the street, and we took action. I turned around and saw the police fan out on the, behind us and then trap and blockade us on both ends. We knew right then and there that the, that the negotiations were over, that they had planned this all along, and it probably came from the top, including the mayor. Well, uh, I think it was certainly legal, it's certainly proper, and it certainly was preventative and proactive. But the strategy was to get less, to, you know, to decrease us on the streets by far and to get rid of some of the strong leadership that was at that protest. We get corralled up like animals. They didn't tell us that they were going to arrest us. They gave us no option to do We sat there, we stood there, we didn't move, we didn't make no trouble. But they still went on and told, arrested everybody. 600 people got arrested. Jessica, why were you here? Jessica, why are you here? Let media. Um, I think whenever you're dealing in a situation like this, you're going to be up on the boundary line in terms of constitutional rights. They didn't tell us nothing. They didn't charge us with anything. They just told us $50 to get out. That was it. We just felt it was just extortion. Besides the sensory deprivation and the, the torture and the dehumanization process. And everyone's sitting there with their, their wrists tied to their ankles. If you want to move around and make a phone call, you have to like hop across the room on one leg. It was the most humiliating dehumanizing experience I've ever had in my entire life. We found out that they were telling people, uh, giving them legal advice, in fact, and saying that if they did not post and forfeit, um, that they would be held there until Monday or Tuesday. They said that they had tents out back and that people were going to sleep in the rain and that sort of thing, yeah. and it just wasn't true. There's no injury to anyone. Everyone's been treated in a very respectful manner. They put you in these plastic handcuffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, the pain is just excruciating. It really is. In fact, the majority of people were put on school buses all night long, anywhere between six hours to 12 hours. I've been handcuffed since 6 o'clock at night, so I got uncuffed at 7 o'clock this morning. The, the, the 678 people who were arrested were political prisoners. Yes, absolutely, because it was, those arrests were based on our political beliefs. Yeah, it's gonna be a good day, man.
to shut down the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, we want to shut down government in general, full stop. Uh, we believe that uh, capitalism can't be reformed. Uh, we're out here today to show support for people that are locked down, to help them out, to uh, uh, support them in the streets. Uh, we're staying mobile so the police can't clamp down on us. And uh, that's about it. I think people see a bunch of, you know, people dressed in black with their faces covered, and that's a scary image for them, you know. And but if you took like two minutes to talk to any one of those people, you would realize that they are intelligent. They, you know, they care about what's going on, or they wouldn't put themselves on the line. Oh no, I'm okay. Beautiful. Please try to uh, be very divisive and say that there were a certain uh, fringe uh, militant group that uh, didn't represent everyone's interests. Um, right now, mobilization of global justice, all the people that, uh, that are down in Austria have to sense to make a lot of space for different um, tactics and different politics. I know we can all work together and the coalitions that we form are going to change this world. I think there's a lot of people that see the black bloc as their safety net in a lot of ways. Like, I definitely saw it at the protest. I saw some negative reactions, but I also saw some people being like, oh, they're here. Now we know what to do. Now we know how to set up our barricade because these are the kids that aren't afraid, you know, to, to actually drag dumpsters, dumpsters into the street and make those a part of the human barricade that actually aims stuff. They're not afraid to, like, move cars out into the street. They're not afraid to stand there and push at the police line. older than you guys are. <laughs> but, uh, man, this is, this is really something. And we can see by the police repression uh, in the city today that uh, it's coming closer to home. 
uh, so to resist the, the IMF and the World Bank uh, is not just uh, liberating the third world, uh, not just the fight for uh, human rights and the environment elsewhere, it's, it's making uh, th this country uh, safer for its citizens. But it's exciting, you know, I mean, we're actively stopping people from getting in here and forcing not only the media, but, you know, the delegates who are actually having to deal with us to, to read our signs and deal with what we're saying. <laughs> energized by seeing so many young people come out and uh, be committed to a cause, whatever it might be, and it very much shares the cause that we in organized labor are committed to. I think that people are waking up to the idea that their democracy, so-called democracy, has been taken over by institutions like the IMF. Um, we're going to have a spokes council meeting in a couple of minutes, which is that each affinity group has one spokesperson. We're all going to get together. Um, some people want to stay. Other people really want to go to the legal protest. I think that will also be really powerful. And then some other people at their proposal are considering sort of doing something independently. I'm a little concerned about press, and I think it's wrong that they're trying to go through our barricades. I've been clobbered twice already by the press, and I don't want anyone to get hurt. Does anybody want to let people on case-by-case -case basis? No. You have to use your... That's no one always to decide case-by-case basis. We make a consensus, either yes or either no. Yes or no. This is a protest. It's inconvenient, but it's nonviolent. Uh, it's been very democratic. I mean, sometimes even painfully so, because we're we're really really working it out. And we basically came to a consensus to, that the way to hold the blockade was to hold it completely. And um, it'd be too easy for the delegates to come in with, with press, press pass. It's not my decision, it's a collective decision. That's ridiculous, really. No. Financial time? Yeah. Financial time? Yeah. No, thank you. That's financial times. They're not on our side. <laughs>